the group is going to talk to you about tillage, but we're particularly interested in tillage after either a cover crop or a herbal lay. And um, I'm going to particularly concentrate on some ongoing, fairly long-term experiments we're doing. We'll try and get through the sort of uh, more formal talks in about half an hour, and then we're going to throw it open for you to ask us more about what we're doing. Some of this work's been going on for ages. Some of it is pretty much sort of three quarters of the way through. So uh, it's a sort of a watch this space kind of scenario. So uh, Lizzie and I are going to talk. We've also got a film, actually. And then my colleagues, uh, Will Smith, Lizzie Sagu from ADES, and David Clark, also from, AD uh, from NIAB, sorry, <laughs> uh, are not going to give a talk, but they are experts on things related to uh, the, the talk. So, straight into. So, there are a, a range of different tillages. I'm not going to go through all of them. There's been better people than I that have talked about the many different uh, components. But the sort of the four main ones: inversion tillage or ploughing, uh, direct drilling at the other extreme, and then various different uh, intermediary like uh, shallow non-inversion and single pass systems, etc. Which ones to choose? So we're looking at what to choose after certain previous scenarios. I'm going to concentrate primarily on these two extremes, but I'll touch on some of the others as well. So one of the long-term pieces of work that we've been doing is to see what could be the effect of introducing a complex herbal lay into an arable system, and what impact is this going to make on the soil, and how can you kind of retain that impact, assuming it's good impact. And, um, you could, you could in, include this in a system with livestock, or you could literally just look at mowing. So this is, this is not just for the, the livestock farmers. This is very much um, a system to look at how we can do something to the soil, uh, regardless of what kind of a farmer you are. We're part of a, a long-term four-year uh, project, which is funded out of BBSRC mainly, and we have a, a range of people on the group uh, this is, again, primarily looking at the work that's being done by Naya, but these are all very important members of our group, and it's a field-scale project. I'm going to dash through this because I want to actually get some of the results. Uh, the, the main one that we have at Naya, but we're also working in combination with a number of farmers, is at Duxford. My wire is going to allow me to point here. So, this happens to be the orientation we have at Duxford. We've got uh, a grass clover lay on one side of the field. We're comparing this from a complex herbal lay on the other side. And then various different management uh, inputs are happening as we go along. This is the way we have it at Duxford. We've got a, a slightly different orientation at others. We've got a conventional tillage wheat as a control at the bottom. And this is what the herbal look lay looks like. Actually, it's really easy because you can go and have a look at it. It's just out there. And um, the particular one that we chose is, is supplied by Cotswold Seeds. There's various other ones out there. This is a particularly complex one and suited the purposes of what we were trying to do, which was to find out you know, what, is the, what is actually happening. We know that it has an impact on the soil, but we wanted to know precisely what. There's just a quick list of the species. I'm not going to dwell on that. Here's other orientations, and so what we've done is, as I said, you've got the, the grass, you've got the herbal. We're either mowing it or grazing it, and after two years, we've taken out a chunk, uh, which has either been um, tilled with plough and harrow, or it's uh, direct drilled into the following arable crop. And then finally, the last one, a whole lot goes into arable. So a quick dash through, if you want more details of that, I can perhaps tell you about it afterwards. I'm looking at a range of things, but this, at this point, I just want to have a look at the main outcomes in terms of what sort of management and then what might be the outcomes in terms of different tillage. So this is where we are now. I can't tell you what's happening in the fourth year. We're not there yet. And here is just a beginning look at the data as it's coming through. So this is our Duxford site, and we, first of all, were looking at establishment. Well, we expected that the establishment would be down a little bit. Um, not too bad. So just to give you a feel for those at the back that can't see the um, 
the axes, the yellow bars are the herbal lay, the green bars are the grass, and uh, you've got the ploughed results on the left, and we've got the direct drilled in the middle, and then the arable control on the right. So in terms of establishment, the uh, ploughed is pretty much the same as the, as the arable. We just wondered whether there was a difference at site. Interestingly, we get pretty much the same pattern. This is one of our yeah, companion we, farmers we, that were emulating yeah, the work we, at Loddington in this case. So they had very, very similar, I mean, you can hardly all expect it. Um, I thought there was one more slide there. Then we thought, okay, establishment is one thing. What is going to be the actual outcome, though, in terms of, of the tillering? And um, so we went in last week and we did a head count, and this is Patrick. Oh, he's in the audience, uh, counting. And here are the results. So uh, quite a different picture from what you first got with the just a straight establishment. The first thing to note, I guess, is that the herbal lay, which again is the yellow, is, is doing better than the, the grass lay on all um, considerations. Um, the, on the left-hand side there, you've got ploughed herbal lay, which is indistinguishable from the arable um, plough control blue on this side however we all know that there's there's lies down lies and statistics i think it's important to say that the the differences are quite small and so if you look at the whole lot there that's all herbal lay on the left and in the blue that's the um uh the grass lay and the arable on the right and statistically those three are the same so in, in effect we've got the the herbal lay um Make sure I'm actually telling you the right thing here. Direct drilled is on the left, second one along is herbal lay grazed, and then uh, we've got arable on the right hand side. So they are effectively indistinguishable from each other. Uh, Patrick will eventually do the stats properly. Um, and um, so what else? What else is happening in there? So Sam Foyne and Clover kind of volunteers. It's interesting, I hope some of you were at the last talk because uh, we didn't deliberately introduce um, any of these legumes into the following crop. They were sprayed off with glyphosate, and then we either ploughed or uh, direct drilled, as I said. But you'll see, I, I guess the guys at the back and the gals at the back can't see very clearly. Um, in the front here is the grazed part. Above the line is the mown part, and the significantly more of the sand points come through following um, the next stage. This is the grass clover lay, and you can't see yet, but there's another photo. You can see an absolutely beautiful undercarpet of clover that's, that's come through, and then this is the grass grazed and ploughed, which is, is pretty much clean, if you like. And just to give you the full picture, that's the arable on the left, the arable control, and the grass lay which is yet to be uh, taken into arable on the top there. So, <coughs> looking a bit closer, close to me now, you can see that, that carpet of clover coming through. And remember the stats here, that the establishment and the heading um, are, are really not, not bad. We'll wait and see what the final yield is. Um, and then in the, the centre picture, you can see the sand point coming through again. It's really nice to have such a lot of bees coming through into a, a wheat crop. Speaking of the, 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 the need for resources of pollinators, not normally what you'd expect in a... Well, I've got the labels there. So you've got uh, winter wheat following herbal lay on the left, mown, ploughed, middle one, uh, mown, and then direct drilled, and then over this side, grass clover. So some of it's gone into sheep, and we're also looking at um, how the sheep respond in terms of using this resource. I'm not going to go into my, my colleagues' work too much, but suffice to say that uh, we are doing all sorts of other things in terms of soil structure. And Emily Howes from Harriet Watt University has been digging pits and looking at how the infiltration rate is impacted. So you've got the herbal lay, mown, and arable and middle, and grass clover. You can really see that the porosity that's being produced is giving you a very different infiltration rate. She hasn't looked at that data in detail yet, and here finally the herbal lay grazed with a beautiful deep infiltration rate right through the soil profile. 
So I just want to touch also on a little bit of work that's been done primarily by my colleague uh, David Clark here at uh, the, the STAR project. Uh, with, this is a really long term project and this is what it looks like, it takes a long time to explain this, but suffice to say we're looking at um, different tillages times different rotations and we've introduced the herbal lay in the last year to see how that will um, help with all sorts of components of the soil structure but also other issues like the, there was definitely a bit of a black box problem coming up. Dave can tell a bit more about that as we go on. So, So here's a, a sort of snapshot of that going right back to the beginning, 2007, uh, the data goes right through and then the, on the right hand side you've got the average. Not massive differences between them, we're looking at the plough, the deep non-inversion, shallow non-inversion and then the managed, which is deciding what you do that year. So they get together as a, a little committee, what do we need? Probably go for the, the least uh, invasive tillage that's possible, but if it's necessary to drop in a flower, and again, David can tell you a bit more about that if you want details. Uh, but the outcomes, and this is what I guess a lot of you are waiting for, and so the the, the final bottom line, I've lost my, my bottom um, thing here, but we're, we're basically looking at the, uh, the mean margin in terms of pounds per hectare so we've got the, the purple on the right is the managed, and then next to it, again, pretty much indistinguishable, the shallow non-inversion. So a really nice outcome. So now we're going to have a very quick film from my colleague Nathan Morris, who went out to the Duxford I'm side. in a rather windy field near Cambridge, where we have a herbal lay uh, experiment looking at uh, the performance of it in an arable rotation. Um, we also have a grass lay as a comparison and we've just uh, this season put the field into winter wheat uh, where we are looking at conventionally tilled winter wheat versus direct drilling winter wheat. So um, the idea of the experiment really is to try and build fertility uh, into the soil, uh, obviously with the benefit hopefully for the following crops of, of the arable crops and the herbal lay is a mixed species which actually has uh, many properties that hopefully will aid both soil structure and rooting, um, building fertility that will move uh, and assist with the uh, following um, cereal crops thereafter. What I've done here is I've taken a spade full of, of soil and dug a, took a spit out so that we can look at the physical structure of the soil. Here we have the herbal lay, um, just as the, um, one of the treatments, and we can see from the overall block structure, we've got really nice fine uh, crumb structure, um, very good rooting, you can see this is the winter wheat, um, we've got the root proliferating right through the, the profile of the, um, the block and out at the bottom as well, so obviously it's got good potential for getting the um, moisture, capturing the nutrients within the soil profile. Um, we've already uh, looked and found some worms, um, but you can see um, within the block itself, we've got very good macroprosity, um, it's very open structured, and that will obviously be a, a great benefit both for retaining moisture, but also for um, aiding moisture at, at higher levels of, of rainfall, e.g. over winter, when sometimes uh, the pores can become a bit um, closer together with the rainfall, and that limits the um, movement of water through the profile. For comparison, I've also taken one of the samples from the ploughing uh, treatment where we've got um, quite a different structure visually. You can see it's a lot more uh, angular in its structure. You've got quite distinct layers of the profile. And again here you can see the actual plough uh, layer where the residues of the previous crop have been ploughed down. It's quite a distinct layer. But again, we've got a good root structure um, that have again proliferated through the profile. It's not quite as fine. Uh, there's, as you can see there, it's still um, still reasonably crumbly, but doesn't crumble as much as, as the other sample did. Um, but we can still see how those roots have proliferated through the profile. We can see here there there's a water worm um, busy working through the, the residues from the from the um, previous crop. Um, the overall structure, as I said, is, is, is a bit um, more angular than the other one, um, with more of a distinct layer between the surface, um, 10 centimetres or so, 
And then, as you can see, when I, when I pull that apart, it breaks quite clearly on that division line. And then after that, it's a bit harder. There we are, there's a worm busy doing its work, um, pulling the residues down into the soil. So some long-term work that NIAF conducts uh, is looking at rotational and um, tillage cultivation interactions. And we have a STAR project, the Sustainable Trial Enable Rotations, which has been funded by the Morley Agricultural Foundation and also uh, the Felix Thorny Cobalt Trust and the JC Mann Trust. And we're looking at uh, the interactions of tillage and um, rotation. Um, and we've actually seen, this is over 15 years now of the trial, um, that the stability of tillage um, within um, cropping systems, um, and particularly wheat yields, is very stable. There's very little difference. The most likelihood of differences occur with spring cropping, um, and obviously that links to the weather, um, and particularly soil type interactions. Heavier soils obviously have, have an impact on that. Um, but the start project is also um, a sister site in this project where we're also looking at the herbal lay and again when we come out of that we can look at the interaction with cultivation on wheat performance in the uh, forthcoming year. So I'm really excited about that and hopefully you'll see more in the near future. Sorry, Nathan can't be with us today. Now, we invited Lizzie Scoo, ADAS, to join our group because she's also been doing some work with Hayley Lake. She's been looking at soil and ground as well. So it's a very synergistic project. Um, so, passing over to Lizzie. Right, thank you very much, Lydia. Um, yeah, good morning, everyone. My name is Lizzie Scoo. I'm a soil scientist at ADAS. And um, today, I'm going to briefly talk about a couple of bits of work that we've been doing that sort of link to this theme and I think follow on quite nicely to the work that Lydia and Nathan have presented. Um, the first is some work we've done looking at integrating relays into our rotations and the second is some survey work we've done. We've actually asked farmers with relays how they've destroyed their lay and established their next crop. So first of all, I'll start with the Norwood Farm case study. Um, this case study is part of an AHDB beef and lamb project that we've got looking at integrating beef systems into arable units. Um, the project as a whole is looking at um, practicalities, economics, agronomic implications, agronomic and environmental implications of integrating beef into arable systems on temporary lays. Um, across the project we're looking at lots of different things, so we're looking at animal performance, economics, impact on soils, weeds and benefits of the following arable crop. But today I just want to focus mainly on the, on the soils work. Um, so Norwood Farm, it's um, over in Somerset, um, it was a long-term arable farm and it was bought in 2016 by Dyson Farming um, and we've been working with Peter Lord, the farm manager there, on this piece of work. Back in 2017, we had a block of six fields that the farm, that had been long-term arable, that the farm put down to grass and it was these fields that we worked at as part of this um, trial work. Now of those six fields, three we put down to a grass clover mix and three we split. We split two of them between grass clover and a herbal grass clover mix, and that herbal mix included red and white clover, plantain, chicory, yarrow, burnet, sheep's parsley, I'll say clover as well. And the third split field, we split half grass clover and half we left in, the, in an arable rotation to get that contrast between the two. So we were interested in what, what was the benefits to soil quality as a result of putting down the grass, and is there any benefit to the, to the following arable crop? Um, so back in 2017, autumn 2017, when the, the lays were put in, we went out and we did baseline soil assessments across all these fields. And we were looking at measures of sort of physical, chemical and biological quality. And then we went back again three years later, autumn 2020, to repeat those measurements. Sorry. Um, so the headline, measure, the headline um, um, sort of fi figures are such as that um, we increased soil organic matter content, we statistically significantly increased soil organic matter content and earthworm numbers um, as a result of the grass lays. I think it's important to say here that the, these soils were in pretty good condition when we started. It's heavier land, it's over in the west of the country. We know that heavy textured soils in wet areas tend to hold on to organic matter more. 
Um, and so when we started, the soil organic matter content for these fields was around 8% as measured by lost soil emissions. So it was in pretty good condition and actually the structure was pretty good as well. So I have to say, when we went out in 2017 and did these baseline measurements, I wasn't convinced that we would be able to measure a change over the relatively short three-year period. But we have. So we found that, on average, um, soil organic matter content across all the grass fields increased from 7.8 to 8.1%. So that was a 0.3 percentage point increase in organic matter content, and that was statistically significant. And that's equivalent to six tonnes per hectare increase in organic matter content in the top 15 centimetres of soil. Now, we didn't see a difference in the increase in organic matter between the grass and the herbal grass clover mixes. To be honest, I'm not particularly surprised with that. To be fair, both mixes performed well, produced a lot of biomass, and really the main change that we've got here is this change from arable to grassland. We also saw quite a significant increase in earthworm numbers. These increased from, I think, 160 to 250 worms per metre squared as well. So I, I think, I mean, all in all, uh, you know, really positive messages for the farm in terms of the uh, in, improvement in soil quality there. So we're also interested, as well as benefits to soil quality, we've seen these benefits. Is this going to have an impact on the following arable crop? You know, we can hypothesise that it will do, but you know, can, can we measure that? So to answer that question, we focused measurements in one, one field that we call NOR7. This is the field that the farm split, half grass clover, half stayed in arable production. So back in 2017, whole field was winter wheat. Then autumn 2017, Half was put into a grass clover mix, and half stayed in arable. And that arable half was all seed rape, followed by winter trip, which then went into a forage brassica. And this last year, it's been in the HLF, um, HLS wild birds seed mix. And then in spring this year, the whole field has come back into spring barley, so we've returned it to arable. Um, the farm sprayed the layoff of glyphosate, and then the whole field was plowed on top down. We left it up to the farmers how they wanted to establish that crop, and they felt, and I think, you know, I, I agree that on that heavier soil, that particular field needed some sort of cultivation to establish, to establish the crop. So that crop's growing at the moment. When we harvest it, we'll look at difference in the yields between the two halves. The other thing we've done is we've put full end response experiments in each half of the field to see whether, to determine what the optimum nitrogen rate is in both halves and to see whether we can see a difference in that. You know, the hypothesis will be that the optimum end rate will be lower if we followed the lay because of that mineralisation from the lay, but it'll be good to be able to see now. So it's a case of, with this work, watch this space. We are, fingers crossed, having an open day here on the 23rd of September, so if you're interested in coming along, keep an eye on the AHDB Beef and Lamb events page or, or to give me your email at the end. This leads us on to a discussion about, you know, if you have got lays, how, how best to destroy them. And I think um, the decision on how best to destroy a lay on your farm is going to depend on a number of different factors that may will depend vary between farms and may well vary between fields on your farms and between years as well. And the key questions are, are you going to spray or not? And are you going to cultivate or not? And if you are going to cultivate, how are you going to do that? The sorts of factors to consider, you know, farming system. If you're an organic farmer, you're not going to spray, and that in turn will impact on your cultivation decisions. And we'll, we'll see a bit in there. Cost of establishment methods. Lydia showed quite nicely um, about how the cost of establishment vary between systems. Obviously, if you can reduce tillage, you reduce your establishment costs. That might be beneficial for your bottom line, as long as that reduced tillage doesn't you know, result in a knock-on reduction of yields. Weed pressure, you know, think back to before your lay, what were the weeds that you had in that field before the lay, and would those weed seeds still be viable if you plowed them up now? You know, we're seeing more farmers that are using lays to help with control black grass, you know, that's an important factor for you. You probably don't want to be plowing at the end of the lay. You know, black grass seeds do decline in the seed bank, but some will still be viable five years later, so you want to try and avoid plowing them up. But if black grass, grass weeds aren't that much of an issue for you, that, this factor isn't so, so important. Seedbed quality, um, you know, and, and you, know, you need to create a good seedbed for your crop, and sort of texture, any compaction in the soil, and the following crop you're sowing as well. Soil quality, we've talked about, we've seen already that you know, when you put land down to lays, you may sequester carbon under that lay. You want to try and hold on to that carbon, and we know that if you 
till the land will oxidise that carbon. So that's the really important fact of you, you know, reduced tillage or no tillage might help you keep hold of that carbon. But carbon is not the only component of soil quality, so structure is also very important. And if you had put a bit of compaction into that grass field, you know, maybe you've had livestock out, if they've been out late, you might have put compaction from poaching. You might actually need a little bit of cultivation to try and remove that, um, remove that compaction. And all these factors sort of combine to, to, to have an impact on the yield of your following crop. As part of the Grass and Herbal Lays Network, we asked farmers that had lays about how they destroyed their lay and established the next crop. Um, this network was set up back in 2018 with DEFRA and AHDB. Um, it was set up as a partnership between farmers, um, researchers and industry to give us a platform for discussion and for, for further work on the rotational benefits of lays. Anyone can get involved. If you Google it, you'll find, you'll find the web page. Now, um, as part of registering people with the network, we asked them to fill out a short survey. And for farmers with lays, we would ask them how they manage their lays. And we also asked questions about how they destroyed that lay and put it into the next crop. So one of the questions we asked was, do you use glyphosate or another weed killer um, to destroy your lay before establishing the next crop? So we had 65 farms with lays that answered this question, and 46 of them, so 71%, said yes, they sprayed. Um, at the end of their lay, and 19 of them, so 29%, said no, they didn't spray. And then we also asked about what type of cultivations they used to establish the next crop. And you can see here, I can't, you, you can see the percentages that I've got the glare off the screen, but um, you know, I think um, plow based cultivations were just under half of respondents. Then we've got 24% men tilling, 2% um, strip tillage, and 28% um, no till, so they were direct drilling. But we can also look at that, break that down, depending on whether you, whether these farmers sprayed or not. So the pie chart on the far, um, this side is the responses from the farmers that did spray off their lane. The further that side is the responses from the farmers that didn't spray off the lane. So the, the 46 farmers that did use a spray, of those you can see it's pretty evenly split between those that use a plough based cultivation, minimum tillage and direct drill. But as expected, for those farmers that um, didn't spray, more of them, that was 19 farmers, the majority of them did use um, a plough-based cultivation. 22% were minimum tillage, 9% didn't till. So that 9% is, represents two farmers. We have two farmers that told us they didn't spray and they didn't cultivate. So I say, I'm not quite sure how they did it. I'd be very interested to know. So just sort of a, a few concluding factors. Um, we know that putting lays into arable rotations has a number of positive benefits. You know, when you come to the end of your lay, if you're thinking about options for destruction techniques, make sure you consider all the factors and which of those factors is more important for you on your farm. <coughs> Remember that that might vary between your fields and between years. You know, and also, I'd say experiment. You know, if you're interested in potentially trying out something a bit different, you know, give it a go. Look at split field comparisons. You know, say you're ploughing at the moment and you're thinking about minimum tillage, try out on a couple of fields. You know, split the fields and do things on different sides. If you've got yield maps on your combine, um, you can look at the impact on yields, or you could even get satellite or drone data to look at the impacts on the following arable crop. Um, and if that is something that any of you have done, um, we'd be really interested to sort of hear your comments and feedback now. Thank you. Shall I pass back to you for discussion? Thank you so much, Livia. Really brilliant. It's, uh, as you see, there's a great synergy between the work that's going on at ADES and, and us at NIAB. So, I'm going to throw it open for questions and comments. Well, Patrick up to the stage, Patrick McKenna from NIAB. Uh, my colleague George is going to dash about with a microphone. So, um, any questions? Um, I'm going to ask my my friend David Clark a question to get you to get your juices going. George, can you see one over there? So, David, how uh, do you decide what you're going to do in the managed um, version at start in terms of uh, tillage, and how often you're getting ploughing in, in that system? Um, so, it's mainly done on what what crop we're going into. So. The, the rotation at Star is primarily uh, all seed rate, winter wheat, and the odd pulse. Um, however, we have introduced sugar beet into the rotation as the farm has that uh, as an important crop. So 
for example, the managed approach prior to and after the sugar beet went into ploughing. Um, we also use penetrometer data to highlight if we're having a pan um, established. And when we start to see that getting tighter in the managed approach after a number of years of shallow cultivation, we then may, may introduce a, a deeper cultivation or uh, an inver inversion cultivation. <coughs> we also take grassroots into account. So we, uh, Lydia mentioned the STAR trial has got black grass pressures. Um, so for example, one of the rotations is continuous wheat. And for the last two years, we've pretty much had to spray off all the continuous wheat shallow non-inversion plots. Um, because we, we can't keep on top of the grass root pressures in those plots. The continuous speed plow plots have got no grass root pressure whatsoever. So if we start to see grass root pressures creep into other systems in the managed approach, whether it's spring cropping or winter cropping, we then might introduce a plow and leave that for five years, or potentially longer. And obviously conditions on the day, we, we go with the farmer. If it's really wet or really dry, we then make a decision based on that. It's a super heavy site, isn't it? The lady there, please. Hello, I'm just I'm interested in whether you saw any differences between in soil, in sort of shallow soil structure issues, grazed versus not grazed in the herbal lay or grass. Sorry, it's a question for Lizzie. So in the grazed beef, well, all those fields were grazed. Okay. Um, and in terms of soil structure, as I said, it was the soil was in pretty good nick when we started. And so when we did, we did a whole load of visual soil assessments. We looked at soil structure and bulk density. Um, it was in good condition when we started, and it was in good condition when we finished. There was a slight increase in bulk density under the grass, but I think that's to be expected. And we tended to tend to see a slight increase in bulk density. Um, but we weren't, I would say, we weren't seeing any, we didn't identify any soil structural problems in, in those fields. Which is what I've, I've majored on the, the two headlines in terms of where we saw changes. The changes was a change in organic matter and, and earthworms. But it's uh, um, used quite a lot for people not to put them in because of the risk of soil damage. So it's quite, because there is no difference, it's quite a nice thing to highlight. Yes, um, obviously it depends on the years, the animals, you know, stocking rate, etc. I mean, we do see, I have seen fields that have been poached and can create, creates a compaction problem. I, I would say that's where it comes to looking at the particular fields and seeing whether or not you think you've got a problem with compaction in the, in the tops of that field and then, you know, making your decision on cultivations based on that. So, George, I'm just going to ask Patrick while George is coming down the front here. I'd like to see you for next. Um, Patrick, we've got grazed and mowed in ours. Did you notice particular areas where there was anything like puddling or, or compaction issues? Um, yeah, so just like Lizzie was just saying there, it's very much dependent on the stocking rate, um, and whether you're doing a mob grazing or a continuous system um, as well. So our Duxford site, you just saw his, his mob graze twice a year for two weeks by 150 sheep. And our Valentine drive is more of a continuous system where they just moved around throughout the, uh, throughout the year. And we've certainly seen some big differences in establishment and the first biomass assessment at close stage 30 in the wheat, in the grazing and the bonnet side, in the grazing, the, the grazing treatment and the bonnet side, um, because the sheep were, were on the whole year and they were kind of trampled a bit quickly. Um, so I think it, it's, it's not a bad idea, but it just does depend on, on how often they're, how long they're off. We're, we're an organic farm and we, we, have a, we graze our lays um, and the, we, we try and experiment to sort of determine whether we're better off to mow and mulch or whether to graze, either with cows or sheep. And we, we, we've not come to any real conclusions. Have you got anything that's more conclusive? Uh, like I said, the, the effects of the grazing in our Lonington site is that the grazing has definitely inhibited uh, wheat production the following year. But it's only ongoing this year, so the harvest at the end of the year, but I'm quite certain it's going to show that the bone treatment was better in that particular site. But it's because it's a very heavy soil, it's at the bottom of the hill, and I just think the sheep were probably sleeping there at night time, spending a little bit more time in that part of the field than, than elsewhere. But what about yield? Yeah, not so much soil structure. Oh, yeah, what, about, what about the, the biomass it? at gross stage 30 was much lower in grazing than in mowing, and I very much expect that the yield will be reduced as a result of that. Yeah, I can, I can, I've got a photograph, you can see it in front of me, I'll show you after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I, I was just going to ask you again, <laughs> um, how it, so you said you haven't seen that much difference between your grazing and mowing with the cover crop? No, 
Okay. So it, for, the, for the following part that um, that you've gone into. Yeah, we go. We 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 we, we generally plow and go into wheat, but we've not we've not seen a massive. Um, we, we can't differentiate really between okay, mowing, you know, mulching down or. or We'd like to think putting the animals on is yeah. better, but it, it's yeah. not conclusive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A uh, question for Lizzie, please. Um, you've got a slide there of different destruction techniques from various growers, uh, some using glyphosate, some not. Um, I just wonder whether you had any feedback at all at the success of killing clover and herbal lays with glyphosate and then establishing a following cereal by direct drilling. Um, okay, so that, that particular thing was from a survey that we, we did, and um, we didn't particularly ask about that. Um, I'm wondering whether there's someone else that could comment on that. Uh, yes, yeah. Um, glyphosate, no um, race of glyphosate will be able to knock back the clover. They won't necessarily kill it outright, so it can help with establishing a crop, but it won't actually kill it outright. Um, we've got some work at our black grass site where we slight by accident, but we had a clover lay under some spring beans, under sowed spring beans, uh, which we left in to establish our, our winter wheat crops. And that had a, a litre and a half of glyphosate pre-drilling, um, and was perfectly successful at just knocking the clover back well enough to um, establish the wheat crop. The disadvantage in that scenario under high black grass pressure is that the, the weed came back, that, that wasn't six well. Initially, it was controlled by the one half litre of glyphosate, but there wasn't any other herbicides used in that system. So you've allowed the background weed population, which Lydia sort of mentioned, and Lizzie mentioned, uh, to take over. Um, and in the two trials we've tried it in the the background weed pressure is out competing the wheat very strongly. Thanks. And I, and I think David's got some comments yeah. to make about clover. Yeah, so we, it's slightly it's different work, but the sort of boards at the back of the in the blue with the zebras, we do some work at Morley with white clover companion cropping um, and that was drilled in 2017 and we had not really drilled it and that gets two litres of glyphosate every autumn and that we can't get rid of the clover really we're, not, we're trying not to but it doesn't get rid of the clover particularly when we're not giving it a heavy cultivation um, there's both a combination of probably a bit of you know doesn't kill it but also it sets seed through the year so then anything that comes back is previous seed so I suspect the lays you might having Typically, some of those low-growing clovers, you might have seed setting and going into the system that way. Thank you. Um, very interesting. Um, as far as the um, establishing after herbal lays, I think, I think the results are pretty conclusive. Um, have you done any more on? Sort of establishment after cover crops, both an overwinter cover crop and, a, and, a, and perhaps a, a summer one. Um, you know, we're obviously increasingly looking at that rather than taking land out of production. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, uh, obviously we're looking at that low cost cover crops as well. You know, it can add an awful lot of cost to our systems. Um, and uh, you know whether you looked at the benefits uh, and the techniques of establishing after cover crops under the herbal lays. Yep. So um, a long-running trial at Morley, we're looking at uh, a radish and oat cover crop before spring breaks every other year, and then after that we have either we plough shallow non-invert or um, deep non-inversion to 20 centimetres. Uh, historically, in a plough system, we don't see any benefit from the cover crop compared to plough systems without a cover crop. Generally, the plough systems always yield higher. Um, the margin data is similar to star. Margins are always better on the shallow on the version. But from using cover crops in a plough system, we never see any benefit really. But it's probably that actually just you, what the cover crop's doing in a shallow non inversion system, you're doing with steel and diesel in the plough system. However, in the shallow non inversion system, we do see an improvement where we use cover crops compared to shallow non-inversion not using cover crops. Um, the deep non-inversion is a bit more noisy in terms of the data. So yeah, it's in summary, sort of ploughing, we don't see a response from using cover crops. In when we're not tilling as hard, we do see a response compared to tilling without a cover crop or shallow non-inversion without a cover crop. And in terms of margins, it's it. It, it pays for itself. We don't see massive yield uplifts across the 13 years of the trial when using cover crops, um, but we keep the costs down so the radish and oats are reasonably cheap. 
we try and establish it with minimal uh, cultivation, so try, try and do it under sort of 40 pound a hectare. And we generally see that you know, yields in the shallow run inversion pay for themselves, but it's certainly not lifting yields in, on that trial. Yeah, other, other than the work that David talks about, actually, there ha really hasn't been that much work done in this area. I mean, I think some of the most interesting things that I'm seeing at the moment is actually work that farms are trying out themselves. I mean, the one I've noted recently, we've done a bit of work at least the Scotland Growers um, up in Scotland as part of a, a whole strategic farm. They're having quite a, um, quite good success um, with um, cover crops before breast cabbage and actually primperola strip till. Um, they've been going into a couple of crops that are between sort of knee and waist high. Primperol followed by strip till has worked really well for them and they've compared it with um, sort of their conventional and they're saying that I've seen a hit on yield. I think it really kind of shows you just to try that out on your farm. Just as a side note, the biggest difference we've seen in, in variability is when we've not sprayed the, the timing of uh, desiccating the cover crop. When we've been too late, regardless of the system, we've struggled. Uh, previous, the next crops have struggled where we've gone a bit earlier before Christmas. Um, we said to see more positive results. So, I hope this isn't a goodly, but uh, in the absence of glyphosate, how would you uh, look at it? <laughs> it was a bit me. That's definitely for Will, that one. <laughs> um, I think it, it quite clearly shows that the plough then has a really, really important role to play. Um, in the absence of glyphosate, there doesn't seem to be, um, in, in terms of success, that's going to be the, the, the most obvious choice, but I think a combination of, of different times of shallow cultivations uh, might, might play a role, but it's going to depend on the species within your cover crops. You talk about a crimper roller, it seems to be successful on something like a radish, something that is more broad leaf, but if you've got quite a lot of grass in your, in, in your cover crop or your lady you're trying to destroy, I think that's going to be um, less successful. Um, so it might require a, a different approach depending on what is in your cover crop. And actually, um, um, East of Scotland growers that I mentioned, they started looking at the crimp parole um, a couple of years ago, and that was specifically because they could see a time when they might be able to use glyphosate. I, I know just that an anecdote of the raw growers that are really keen on not using glyphosate as much as they can, so they're sort of using buckwheat or is it buckwheat that's very possible. From the cold sensitive, so, so there might be options that way. They're looking at uh, not we may not have them now, but varieties that are really really don't like the cold to naturally die off. But I think that will come if we ever get to that point. So I think there was a question over here somewhere, or did I just imagine that? Oh, I, I just had a question on time. time is, uh, I saw it come. <laughs> Just one at the back. Just wet the jaws together. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I might already have. Um, this question might have been answered. I might have missed it. There's um, any. Obviously, there's a long-term study going on. Back on the field, right. Uh, is there any data that you have got like a five-year rotation, have a GM average comparison between, let's say, conventional and using cover crops? So throughout throughout the rotation, you know. Over, over the three years or whatever the rotation is, if you just average that out across all the crops in the rotation, um, and the, the two systems would be conventional and using cover crops and direct drilling or whatever. Yes, yeah, so this is just one site of data at Morley, uh, a sandy loam soil. Um, the, the margins in the shallow non inversion tend to pay for itself. So the cover crop will, with, you know, it's not significant yield increases each year, but we do see little yield increases. So when we just look at the margin, we tend to say, you know, you, you probably get it back. In a conventional plough system, we have not, you know, the, the yield difference is not there. Sometimes we've not really seen a significant yield reduction, but we can't say we've offset the cost of the cover crop in those systems. But we do see the other benefits that they give in terms of the, the nitrogen capturing. Um, and, and the ground cover over winter, but we're not seeing an economic performance increase when we're ploughing with after cover cross across the rotation. Yeah, I, okay, I think yeah, I, I think I got that bit. The, the bit was: is there a comparison between not using uh, cover crops at all and just farming it as? Yes, yeah, so that so, so it's a fully replicated trial. So there'll be ploughing with cover crops, exactly the same rotation. Ploughing without cover crops on four plots replicated. 
um, and we, we do the margins on all of them and, and take all them to yield. And then, there was one other question as well, Hack, which um, obviously the Sunset Farm survey, they're grazing the maize, is that correct? The Sunset? Um, yeah, the farm there it was mainly grazed. They did take odd cuts from it as well, but yeah, all fields were grazed. So, is there any, do, do you, I don't suppose the survey sort of got down to the point where they were working out what it cost to run the sheep on them and whether it was. Whether there was that was costed, anything was costed at all? Yeah. So um, the survey that we did was sort of completely separate to that. That was of all farmers with lays. At that particular farm, part of the work we've done on that project has been an economic analysis of the different systems. Um, I don't have the results, then, but that that will all be presented as part of the project. And that we're also producing sort of an, an, economic, an economic cost benefit tool for the farmers that they can use to look at you know costs of a setting up the system and the sort of return they need to get. And I've got another question. <laughs> um, is anybody looking at what the possible costs of um, carbon might be in terms of farm situations? So I know this is probably a long way ahead, but you know, if we can prove, if we can carbon audit and prove that we've been capturing it, uh, is there any, is there any sort of any hint of, uh, of a financial value on it? At all? Wow. Um... <laughs> I'm going to make some comments. I mean, I, th I think this is such a thorny question, isn't it? Because um, lots of farmers have said to me, and I don't doubt to my colleagues, if you've been doing the right thing and you've um, you've you've looked after your soil, you would hope that uh, you won't start from sort of point zero now, and you only get uh, um, payments or whatever associated with improvements. And so there's there's a lot of uh, work going on to, to get a feel for not just an audit of, of how the soil is now, but how it's, uh, how it's been changing and how that relates to management. Do you want to make some comments, David? Already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Howard? Yeah, yeah, to be honest, I, I, I don't know enough to make uh, an educated opinion. But... I mean, it's certainly something that I'm hearing people ask a lot, yeah. and you're trying to avoid answering the question. I mean, it's going to be really difficult really, really difficult to measure. I would say that there are so many other benefits of improving soil organic matter content, you know, on the farm. So I would focus on, you know, practices that improve organic matter because it's going to have lots of benefits for the crops on your farms. If you manage to get paid for it in addition to that at some point in the future, that's a bonus. But, I mean, also, I have heard someone say a while ago, when this question was asked at the conference, you know, it's not a get out of jail free card. You know, we need to reduce our carbon emissions and not just use this as a sneaky way. Um, to avoid doing that. Yeah, and I will say, looking at looking at the sustainable farming initiative and the, the, the guidelines they're putting in that now, is I think it's more likely to be well, they're sort of implying not measuring how much you're doing, but being paid for for techniques that they know or we've shown to increase carbon, whether it's minimum tillage, whether it's trees and hedgerows, whether it's maintaining hedgerows. Those are more likely to be paid for in those schemes for the, the things you are doing, not necessarily the results that you're you're actually recording. We're having a particular interesting conversation on this front on the, uh, the Fenland soil because we have deep uh, Fen organic soils, we've got shallow organic soils and um, so-called wasted, which is not a term I like too much. So, you know, you, you're already automatically starting with a very high organic matter, 60 plus percent. Um, and looking after those is as important as a, a mineral soil. Um, there are emissions associated with farming those, but I don't think that that's, uh, in my personal opinion, a reason to, to stop farming those soils, but perhaps we have to do it slightly differently. I'd like to have some comments from the audience, actually. I'm tempted to pick up somebody. Some of the ones that I knew earlier have, uh, have, have snuck off. We're just running into the last um, couple of minutes. I want to finish in about three minutes. So has anybody got any further questions? Ah, oh, there's a gentleman. George, there's a gentleman in front of you. It seems like there's tons and tons of information that you guys have got through. How, 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 how would you suggest that's the best way of you know, accessing that information? Or is it as simple as going to your websites and just following through? Or is there, is there a one-stop one place we can get some? Okay, so I'll start and I'll pass over to Lizzie because obviously she's in a different organisation and I think I'll, I'll also to my colleagues because we have different ways and different places. So um, I think my colleagues would shoot me if I'd say there's the NIAB membership scheme where you can get um, 
a really broad array of, of data that comes not just from our project work but from all of the uh, small scale or larger scale trials that are, are done specifically for membership. There's um, scientific papers, so you know, you know our names, you can literally look us up and you'll find um, uh, peer reviewed papers of the work that we've done, so Patrick will be producing a couple within the next uh, couple of years. George, who is, is just the, uh, the person that's taken the microphone around, he's also working on soils. He'll be producing his uh, papers within the next couple of years. And then um, we will be pushing uh, information through to the, uh, the, the farming um, magazines, for want of a better word. So who are you talking to recently, George? Arable farming. So uh, you can get information from those. And then, um, so, so, our, so a lot of our work, so the star work and the cover crop work I've talked about is charity funded, so it's funded by the Morley Agricultural Foundation, um, so as well as NIAF's website, the results are also published uh, as reports on those, those websites. Um, we also have some YouTube videos I made when we weren't allowed out last summer uh, detailing some of those trials, so have a look at them. Um, but uh, again, they're, they're, chari they're farmer charity organisations, so we sort of try and get them out into, these are like accessible forms, so we do have papers as well, but there's also leaflets and flyers in the, in the blue gazebo at the back there where you can find more information about all those trials. Yeah, you can literally Google star and there's an enormous yeah. amount of information so there's a good stars on, online. had a 15 year report published two years ago that summarises all the results, and then the new farming systems, my colleague is who isn't here today, is currently producing the long term report from all that work that will be published in the autumn. Lizzie. Yeah, in terms of the AHDB Beef and Land Project, um, that will, the results of that will be available at the beginning of next year on the AHDB website. Um, I mentioned the Grass and Herbal Lays Network. If you Google that, you'll find our webpage. And if you register for that, we're going to try and use that as a route to um, put out sort of highlights of messages coming out of a few different projects that we've got. But, I mean, I'd also say, come to events like this, listen to the headline messages, and go and have a go on the farm. Brilliant. I think in the last minute, if anyone's got any more pressing questions, um, I think I'm just going to literally thank my friends, Will Smith, Lizzie Sagu, Patrick McKenna, David Clark, and I'm Lizzie Smith, and thank you very much, George, for being my co-person.